I want us to pause and review what we've covered so far. I want to encourage you to keep engaged in our class. I appreciate your commitment to ministry training. We've covered a lot and have a lot of exciting things ahead. And I realize this subject can be overwhelming with the amount of information we're dealing with, but it's good for you to take it in, to hear the stories and hear the names and dates. It helps you to be informed and equipped for more faithful service. We have covered 1,500 years, 1,500 years. Good job. We've talked about the early New Testament church. We've talked about the persecution and spread of Christianity, the fall of Jerusalem and the fall of Rome, the evolutionary rise of the Roman Catholic Church, and the nearly 200-year-long military campaign of the Crusades. So we've covered a lot. Allow me to point out some of the highlights of our study for the sake of your review. Remember what we meant by the expression, all history is biography. The story of history is the story of individual lives and their choices, actions, and ideas. People influence the, full, the flow of history and are constantly affecting change. The story of history is the story of people. Remember, however, that Jesus said, I will build my church. And the church of Christ, the kingdom of God, will stand forever. It will never be destroyed. And we think of those early martyrs who were so committed to the church, the kingdom of God, those martyrs like Polycarp, who were willing to die rather than renounce their faith in Jesus. They were committed to living a resolute life of discipleship, always looking to the Savior. In the second century, we noticed how opposition to the church took two forms, blatant persecution and false teaching and how the church responded with unwavering uh, resolve and a pursuit of doctrinal fidelity. During the first 300 years of the church's existence, it experienced two seemingly paradoxical trends, growth and persecution. In spite of suffering, and sometimes because of the suffering. The church grew and spread as they stayed focused on the mission of gospel evangelism. Finally, we have a dramatic change with the Edict of Milan in 313, which legalized Christianity. It's good that Christians are no longer imprisoned for their faith and executed, but the negative side effect is that Christianity becomes corrupted by political power struggles as it is woven into the fabric of nationalism. The church and state are meshed together, which started a severe corrupting effect upon Christianity. And we have those Christian apologists and then people like Athanasius, who at the Council of Nicaea argued successfully for the orthodox position that Jesus is both fully God and fully human, a position I believe the Bible presents about the nature of Christ, fully God and fully man. The process is begun of having ecumenical councils to try to settle matters of church doctrine. They looked to Acts 15 as their model, as their precedent for these councils, but we should realize the fundamental difference between the Jerusalem council and the subsequent ecumenical councils is that there was apostolic leadership in the Jerusalem council. Uh, you don't have 
inspired apostles in subsequent councils, and so they are doomed to gradually deteriorate in their helpfulness because they rely on the doctrines of men. And the Bible becomes um, to, it, it starts to be moved to the margins, and there is a drift away from the truth of God. And that drift begins to take hold, that momentum away from Scripture and commitment to the model of, of New Testament Christianity, the momentum starts moving away from that model, unfortunately. And we eventually have the fall of Rome in 476, and a dark cloud moves in. Augustine wrote the book, The City of God, insisting that the only lasting kingdom is the one God has built in Jesus Christ. But in 1054, we see the great schism between the Pope and his Catholic Church in the Latin-speaking West and the Patriarch and his Greek Orthodox Church in the East at Constantinople. This pushes us firmly into the Dark Ages with the sad realities of nominal Christianity, falling educational standards, and aggressive militancy. Pope Urban II launched the Crusades which were a series of eight Catholic Christian military expeditions fought against Muslims for possession of the Holy Lands between the years 1095 and 1270. Remember that a pilgrimage is a journey, especially a long one, made to some sacred place as an act of devotion. The theme is still important today, although in modern Christianity the term pilgrimage has often been replaced by the term journey. But in a very real sense, we are all on spiritual journeys. A light begins to shine in the darkness with Johannes Gutenberg introducing the printing press and making the Bible accessible to the masses for the first time. And this sets the stage for what's coming next. Reform and then restoration. Remember Romans 15 and verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is giving us much needed encouragement by reminding us to look back at history, to look at the record of the past. God has, God has worked in remarkable ways in the past, and that story of God's past workings is also our story. Sacred history was written for us, and we have the Bible as a guide for us in all matters of faith and practice. But in this class, most of our time is spent looking at the continuation of the story after the New Testament closes. And as we advance in our study of Christian historical tradition, I want us to continue to be careful observers. We are watching an unfolding drama. We're looking back and observing the good and the bad of those who have come before us. Let's continue to look at their work, to honor their good efforts, while also trying to learn how not to repeat their mistakes. The record of the past is for our instruction, leading us to deepen our hope. Thank you for staying committed to the class, and I am looking forward to what's ahead. 
If you would, I'd like to invite you to pray with me. Almighty God, we are so thankful for your love and compassion, for the many ways that you bless us. Help us as students, as disciples, as we learn and grow in our faith. Help us to never take our gaze off of Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord, and help us. We confess that at times we are weak, that we need your strength and your encouragement. But we are so thankful that you are a God who gives us blessing and favor and encouragement and strength. And we ask for a special portion of those things. Be with us as your children, as Christians, as part of uh, the church of your dear son, Jesus Christ, that we will be faithful and honor you in every way. Help us to love and serve you, to love and serve each other. Bless us and strengthen us, we pray, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.